Father in heaven, I thank you for this morning that you've given us. I thank you for everyone who's joining us in worship today, um, online or in person. I pray that you would just um, continue to continue to keep everyone safe. I pray that our worship this morning would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Ah, we live for you. Good morning. Good morning. You know, I have this, this uh, I think I'm too loud again. Uh, and I might get louder, so you gotta make some adjustments. But, uh, you know, before I, I speak, uh, I kinda always ask God to give me some confirmation that I'm on the right track. And it seems like every time he does that, uh, the second song we sang, God, the three in one, the Father, Spirit, and Son, and then the last song, Jesus, show us who you are. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about this, this concept, which is one of the foundations, one of the pillars of our Christian life, and that is 
the Trinity. The Trinity. So let us pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for another preaching and teaching opportunity. Thank you for your plan that was established before the foundation of the world. Thank you, Jesus, from, for coming down from glory and, and dying on the cross for our sins. And thank you, Holy Spirit, which was sent from the Father to guide us through this mean and crooked world. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, hide me behind the cross that it might be all of thee and none of me. Use me for your glory so that these, your people, might be lifted up. And I praise and thank you in advance for what you're about to do through this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Who is this God that we must love? Deuteronomy. Sixth chapter. The fourth and fifth verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. As we look at this portion of scripture, I want us to think about how important it is for us to understand what God is trying to teach us. See, any time God repeats his word, it is something that is very, very important to him. And therefore, it should be very important to us. This portion of scripture is repeated in Matthew twenty-two thirty-six, 36, Luke 10, 27, and Mark 12, 30. In all three of these New Testament books, there is a lack of understanding as to what this commandment means. If God says something in the Old Testament and repeats it in the New Testament, it tells me that this truth still applies. Not only does this commandment still apply, the lack of its understanding still applies. At the heart of the Christian view of God is the concept of the Trinity. The concept of the Trinity. This truth is central to our understanding of biblical revelation and the Christian gospel, the good news. We first need to understand what Deuteronomy 6 and 4 says in the original Hebrew language. It does not say Jehovah is a lone God. But what it does say is Jehovah, our Elohim, is one Jehovah. What it does say, basically, God, our Elohim, is one God. Let me break that down. See, Elohim is, is plural. It's, but it's a, it's, a, it's a one, but it's a complex one. In other words, it's, it's, it's like one times one times one equals one. 
complex one. So Elohim is, is plural, but it's a complex one. Just like in the creation story where, where God said, let us make man in our image. Let Elohim make man in our image. The complexity of the Trinity. The first three verses of the Bible, God reveals the Trinity for the first time. The first three verses, he wants us to know this first. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God the Father saw what was going on. The Word spoke, let there be light. And the spirit that moved across the face of the water put it into action. That is the Trinity. Now, the concept of the Trinity is all throughout scriptures. But if we don't understand it, we're going to have some problems. And we're going to show you some problems that the Pharisees had. God reveals the Trinity for the first time in the first three verses. God had the plan. The Father had the plan. The Word spoke. How do we know the Word spoke? Because John 1 tells us in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then down in verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. Colossians, first chapter says that all things, talking about Jesus, all things were created by him and for him. And nothing was created that was made except through Jesus. And by Jesus, all things hold together. All things hold together. So Jesus was there in the beginning. The Father was there in the beginning. And the Holy Spirit was there in the beginning. So in creation, creation is from the Father, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. Another way of saying the same thing is the Father originates. The Son reveals, and the Holy Spirit executes. I gave you three places where Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is repeated. But we're going to look at Matthew 22, 34 through 46, because after Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 is quoted, Jesus asked a question that nobody can answer. Matthew 22, beginning at verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, now, right before that, the Sadducees tried to trick up Jesus and talk to him about marriage, and, and the, 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 the brothers all had to, to take as a wife the brother who had died, and, and all of them ended up dying. So they asked Jesus a question, well, well whose uh, wife is she going to be when we get to paradise? So Jesus basically told them, you know, I'm the, I'm the God of <coughs> Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of the living, not of the dead. So he silenced them. 
So now in 34, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, you know, a lawyer, he's supposed to know a whole lot. One of these guys was a lawyer. Asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. They had no answer to the question. See, but we have an answer. Some of us have an answer. But I'm going to give you the answer. Here's what I believe is the biblical trinity, the understanding of the biblical trinity. As Christians, the Bible tells us that we believe in one God who reveals himself in three persons, and these three persons are eternally distinct from one another, and each person of the Godhead is totally and completely God. That might be a little difficult to understand, but we're going to make it plain. I'll repeat that. As Christians, at the, as one of the pillars of Christianity, the Trinity, we believe in one God who reveals himself in three persons. And these three persons are eternally distinct from one another. And each person of the Godhead is totally and completely God. It will help us to understand, it, it, if we understand this term, God. See, God is his nature. God is his nature. There is one nature that belongs only to God. His essence, his deity, uh, his, his, his godness. I just made that up. His godness, if you will. And there are three that have it. When we talk about the nature, the deity, the essence of God, we are talking about attributes. Attributes that, that only God has, qualities that only God has. No other being has them. Omnipotent, meaning all-powerful. Omnipresent, 
all places at the same time. Or in other words, there is nothing in this world, in this universe, that God doesn't see. Everything is in the presence of God. That's omnipresence. Now, Jesus, that might not apply to Jesus, right? Because Jesus voluntarily clothed his divinity and took on humanity. So he couldn't be everywhere at the same time. So he was somewhat limited in his presence because he subordinated himself to the Father because that was the plan. He had to become human because we know that God can't die unless he becomes a man. And that's why Jesus voluntarily came from glory, put on a covering of humanity so he can die on the cross for your sins and my sins. Omniscient. He knows everything. Psalms 139, verse 1 and 2. O Lord, you searched me and know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thoughts from afar. He knows everything. He knows everything from the beginning to the end. He's eternal, timeless. In the beginning, God. See, when time started, God was already here. In the beginning, God. In the beginning was the word. They were already here. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he drove out the enemy from before you and said, destroy. That's the gospel message in the Old Testament. Infinite. Unlimited. We don't even have to look further than the virgin birth. Because God said, I don't need a man to make a child. Unlimited. Unchangeable. Does not vary. James 1.17, tell us that there is no variation or shifting shadow. That's what James tells us. There's no variation in him or, or shifting, uh, shifting shadow. There is no other being that has this nature. These attributes, this essence, this godness. To make it plain, we have to go back in the day. I'm talking about way back in the day to the garden. See, see, Adam was created. And that was the begin, beginning of humanity. Then Eve was created. They were the first husband and wife of humanity. Then Adam and Eve had a child, Cain. And they became the 
first family of humanity. So wherever you looked at that time, there were no other humans. There was no other humanity except in Adam, Eve, and Cain. One humanity, but there were three people that had it. One God, one godly nature, one deity, one divinity, but there are three that have it. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to the question that Jesus asked in Matthew 22. Starting again from verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, then how does David in the spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? No one was able to answer him a word, nor did anyone dare from that day on to ask him another question. See, Jesus explains in this portion of scripture how David was able to hear that conversation that was going on between the son and the father. Verse 43, he said to them, then how does David in the spirit, in the spirit, call him Lord. When we talk about Jesus, and I'm going to share some other things about Jesus, but when we talk about Jesus, we sing songs about Jesus because Jesus is the, 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 the crown of, of what create, Christianity is, is based on. See, because if you don't know who Jesus is, if Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, then you have no connection with the Father, and you have no power to do what God wants you to do because you don't have the help of the Holy Spirit. So that's why Jesus is so important. The second person of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. See, David was able to hear a conversation between God the Father and God the Son through the power of God the Holy Spirit. See, the Pharisees didn't have the Spirit. 
they had no connection. They didn't understand the Trinity because the Spirit hadn't come yet. But see, the, the, the Spirit came at Pentecost. And that prophecy that Joel told us was fulfilled at Pentecost. Joel said, in that day, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that happened at Pentecost. So once we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he indwells us with the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus brings that connection between us and the Holy Spirit and the Father. Without Jesus, we have no connection with anybody. Have no connection with anybody. The greatest commandment, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind, all our being. It's impossible to truly love someone if you don't know who they are. But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And if we don't know him, then our eternal life is in question. John 17, 1 through 3. This is Jesus praying to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he goes to the cross. And this is what happened. Jesus spoke these things as he lifted his eyes to heaven. He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. This is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, who is this you, that they may know you, the only true God? The only true God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And then he says, and Jesus Christ, who he has sent. Because if we don't know who Jesus is and what he has done and receive that gift of salvation, then we have no connection with the Father and we have no help from the Holy Spirit. So, who is this God that we must love? Is God the Father, is God the Holy Spirit, and is God the Son. That's who we must love if we're to understand the, the foundational truth of the Trinity, the foundational truth of the gospel message, how we are saved. We're saved by the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus says nobody can come to the Father and set the Spirit draw. The Godhead working together to work the plan to bring us salvation. Then it, then it says, and the second commandment is like the first. 
Love thy neighbor as yourself. We need help to do that. We need help to do that. So that's why God sent the Holy Spirit to help us live the life that God wants us to live. We can't do it in our own power. We need all power. Because some people just ain't lovable. And we can't love them in our own power. But that's the commandment. So God wouldn't command us to do something that we were incapable of doing. So if he commanded us to do it, there must be a way that it can be done. And the way that is done through God, the Holy Spirit. So this salvation that we talk about, it didn't end when when we received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and we became children of God. Not on our way to a burning hell, but on our way to meet him one day. It didn't end there. The plan is still working. Because God's purpose for us, which you find at the, the bottom of the eighth chapter of Romans. His purpose is to conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So as we sit here waiting for Jesus to come back, we all should be day by day conforming to the image of Jesus Christ. And that's how his kingdom grows. Not by what we say, but by what people see us do. When you're smiling and, you, and, and people know that you're going through stuff and you can still sing those mighty Zion songs and, and, and still smile and, and talk about how much you love Jesus and people will look at you and say, what's wrong with him? What's wrong with her? And that's when you get a chance to witness. It ain't about what I'm going through. It's about what he has done for me. So that that joy that God gives us, the world didn't give it. The world can't take it away. That's how we're supposed to live. As the Holy Spirit teaches us and guides us and day by day we become more conformed to what Jesus did and what Jesus said and what Jesus taught. We become more like him. But we got to know who he is. So now that I've I've tried to explain it to you, just watch how different it is when you read your Bible. It opens up a whole new thing once you understand who this God is that we're supposed to love. We don't serve a God that's one-third, one-third, one-third. All of these attributes that I've shared with you about the nature of God, they all have it because that's the plan. God knew from the beginning that man was going to mess up. He knew that we were going to fall into sin. He knew it ahead of time. He's all-knowing. And because of that, Jesus referred to as the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. God knew he had to come up with a plan before the foundation of the world, before he created mankind, because he knew mankind was going to mess up. And Jesus, who was in glory, who was eternal, he said, I'll go. Prepare me a body, I'll go. And Jesus put on human flesh, covered up his divinity. He was still divine, that's why he's called the theanthropist, the God-man. Jesus is unique. He's 100% God and 100% man. Had to be 100% man because he couldn't die if he he stayed divine. God is eternal. But he put on human flesh, came down and dwelt among us for the sole purpose of going to the cross. Now that Jesus has died on the cross, he rose from the dead and he sits at the right hand of the Father. The only one qualified 
to teach us what God wants us to know is God himself, which is why he gives us the Holy Spirit. Which is why God the Father has given us the Holy Spirit through God the Son who empowers us to live the life that God wants us to live. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal Father, Lord God, we thank you for this marvelous plan that that you created, Lord. Lord, as we study your word and understand who you are and understand the plan, we we come to the realization that there's no way a man could have put this together. No way a man could have wrote this Bible. And Jesus, we thank you for your voluntarily coming from glory putting on human flesh for the sole purpose of dying on the cross for our sins. And Holy Spirit, we thank you as you lead and guide us into all truth and bring back to our remembrance the things that Jesus has said. And as you work daily to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we ask that you continue to do what you do. Mold and shape us into what you want us to be so that we can be true witnesses of your goodness and your grace. So, Lord, we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for what you continue to do. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for what you're going to do in the future. As you come back to take us all home to be with you forever in glory, we stand on that promise, Lord. And until that day comes, we will praise you. We will rejoice in your word. And we will love the one and only true God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We're going to go ahead and uh, sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus again as the ushers escort people out. I know we have to uh, follow the protocol where they're going to uh, release one row at a time. So if you want to stand, we'll go ahead and sing until everyone walks out. Amen.